Good evening. My name is Depesh Patel, editor at Trade Finance Global and host of the podcast Trade Finance Talks. Welcome to this BAFT On Demand Leaders interview as part of the BAFT Virtual International Convention 2020. Today I'm joined by Natasha Condon, Global Head of Core Trade at JP Morgan. Natasha, thank you very much for joining us on Trade Finance Talks. Thank you for having me. Great. So let's get started uh, with my infamous 30 second elevator pitch. So in 30 seconds or less, who are you? Where are you from? And what do you do? I'm Natasha Condon. I am the global head of core trade at JP Morgan Chase, a role I have held since May of 2020, which meant an interesting start to the job in lockdown. And I still have not met a single one of my direct reports. I was previously at Citibank for 16 years, where I was most recently the global trade sales head. I li- I'm British, I live in the UK, and I'm currently speaking to you from the pokey little room at the back of my house. Great, and we're, we're, both, we're both in London, I hear. So let's start with a, with, with a big question, I guess, for, for, for the big role that you cover, US elections, COVID-19, a changing world order, and also the rapid digitalization of trade those are those are some of the big things that have been happening uh, uh, since you started the role in 2020 what out of these uh, events in your opinion have been the biggest challenges for global trade in 2020 and why I feel like the easy answer is to say the pandemic you know clearly it's been a gigantic challenge you know 10 percent I think is the current estimate of the, the the drop in global trade though I've seen anything from from minus 20 to minus 30 earlier this year. Um, Clearly, we all had to scramble. We had the enormous effort to to transfer to working from home. But I wonder if when we look back on 2020 with maybe five or 10 years worth of hindsight, we will see the pandemic as something relatively transient in terms of its effect on global trade. And actually, from your options there, it's the changing world order that is the one that will make the real permanent change. It's the reconfiguration of supply chains around the relationship between the US and China, the long term impact of Brexit, the various other protectionist moves that are happening globally. I, I feel like in the long run, that may be the real issue that we all have to work around. Thank you. And, and, and good point about, I, I guess, the pandemic potentially being a, a catalyst for, for things that were happening anyway, and, and, and this kind of sped, sped those, those issues up. So as one of the largest banks in the US, how, is, how has JP Morgan been helping its corporate customers since the onset of the pandemic? I'm, I'm going to answer that with, with, with respect to trade, obviously, because JP Morgan has, has done an enormous amount, I think, around the pandemic in, in an awful lot of different areas. But for us, I think for me very much in two different areas. First is digitization. That's the obvious one. Many of our clients were left, you know, in in lockdown in various different markets. Paper documents couldn't move. Trade transactions got stuck. Ships were piling up at the ports. And we all had to scramble. I'm sure this is true of the whole market to get various forms of digital solution up and running as an emergency to make sure our clients could keep working. People who were stuck at home in lockdown couldn't sign documents. So on the one hand, a big digital scramble to make sure that our clients could continue to do business. But I think the other one is very much around how our customers have looked at supporting their counterparties and where effectively funding has gone during the pandemic. There's been a lot of focus this year, which I think is wonderful on supporting perhaps smaller counterparties who may not have great access to liquidity, especially in an environment like this, where there's a bit of a flight to quality effect. That's very similar to what we saw, I guess, in 2008. But what is also different this year is that there's also a lot of focus on supporting counterparties who may be, for example, minority owned. There's, a, I think, a strong determination that, um, you know, we have the chance to drive sustainability goals, drive ESG goals, even in the teeth of the pandemic. And I've seen a lot of demand for that from corporate clients. So to me, on the one hand, there's the digital piece that means keep trade flowing. But on the other hand, there is a chance to reconfigure a bit of how we do business and make sure that we're pushing money to where it most needs to go. 
Yeah, interesting. And I think it's it's important to uh, take into account the needs of, of, of your corporate customers. And, and we've been talking about access to trade and supply chain finance for, for, for quite a while now. Would you say the utilization of trade facilities, i.e. trade products, perhaps from a corporate perspective, is, is changing? So are your customers looking for more tailored solutions or different products or, or perhaps to, to help their own customers and suppliers? What are the big trends that you see at the moment in the market? So I guess the, the biggest trend of all to me is, is, is the trend away from, you know, back, back at the beginning of my career in the, in the noughties, if you'd asked me what trade finance was for, I'd probably have told you liquidity, risk mitigation. I think if you said that to a big corporate nowadays, they'd laugh and throw you out of their office. Um, you know, post 2008, we saw a very strong move towards not just risk and liquidity, but look at working capital, look at where we can support the balance sheet as well as just providing funding and, and payment risk mitigation. Now you see clients focusing even more on digital efficiencies, for example, the, the growth in shared service centers has forced that issue because now you often have one person in one market managing a huge complicated global portfolio of, of trade instruments and they've got to have digital solutions or it's impossible. And then additionally now, Perhaps the holy grail is, is sales growth. Clients who want to use trade finance solutions to actually incentivize their customers to, to buy more from them or to find ways to compete more effectively. And then in the last year or two as well, an increasing focus on ESG and sustainability. So any combination of those goals may be in a client's own target list. To me, it's not that the solution set needs to be you know, we don't need to have many, many complex different solutions. What we need is to have a set of basic solutions that are really flexible. They are, must be designed so that they can be customized around the client's goals. And then all you have to do is sit down with the client and really understand what they're trying to do. And your solution set is, is, is ready to go. Do you, do you think there's, I mean, m moving on from, from that point, do you think there's a bit of an education gap when it comes to awareness of some of these products and some of these solutions available for, for the corporate customers? Maybe. I, I definitely think that sometimes clients don't realize what you can achieve with a trade finance solution. You know, they're, they're, they've been used to the traditional applications of the product, if you like. Um, but really, that's our job. The corporate shouldn't have to understand the, the minutiae of how electric credit works or where a draft gets used instead of an open account transaction. That's our piece. We need to go in and have, we need to be having the right conversations with those corporates to understand not just what they think the problem is when they walk into the room, but what they really need to solve to drive the, their business to the next level. And then we'll, we've got the solutions. We'll bring the correct product once we understand what they need. It's asking the right questions that always drives the right conversation. Yeah, great. Um, so I guess let's talk about trade finance as, as, an, as an asset class and uh, alternative finance uh, to, to that respect. Would you say there's been liquidity coming into the, the trade finance market, i.e. new liquidity, perhaps in the form of from pension funds, other investors seeking new asset classes and, and, and pools to invest in? And would you say trade finance presents itself as a, as a good asset class at the moment? Trade finance is an awesome asset class, but it's, it's definitely for investors who understand exactly what they're getting into. I think generally they're, you know, because of COVID at the moment and the fiscal stimulus response that we've seen globally, there is a huge amount of liquidity sloshing around the world looking for somewhere to go. Everyone is looking for yield. Trade finance and risk assets like that are traditionally a place where you can find that yield. So smart investors are absolutely looking in that space. And this isn't just a result of COVID, that was happening before. Um, I think what kind of falls to us as banks, you know, for example, JP Morgan, we have a very sophisticated distribution desk. We have the capability to bring in alternative investors alongside our, our regular panel of, of bank investors, for example. And we are doing an increasing number of exciting, customized, structured solutions, big deals, which are designed to my previous answer around what the client needs to achieve in relatively complicated ways. I absolutely think there is increasing interest from alternative investors to take part in some of that, but it's very much on us to make sure that we're explaining exactly what we're offering in terms of the credit, but also the structure. You've got to understand, I think, to invest in trade, you know, the, the traditional positives, the short term, the self-liquidating, the uncommitted, and everything that comes with that, but also 
you've got to have a good sense of the credit and the market and the diversification of what it is you're you're buying into yeah i think that understanding is is absolutely key because um as you said trade finance is is incredibly complicated when you look at it from from the many different products that are available uh, let, let's talk about the us as, as an american bank what do the results of the uh, recent us elections mean for for trade i think the big issue that everyone was watching the us elections for from a trade perspective was of course the us china relationship um, and if you look at the response of the market, I think probably the answer is not that much, to be honest, in terms of, of, of a difference. Certainly, and I think there was a JP Morgan research paper on this in the last few days, the market doesn't seem to be expecting maybe some of the tariffs that, that might have materialized um, under President Trump to necessarily happen under, under President-elect Biden. But other than that, you know, I don't think anyone's expecting those tensions to go away and the decisions that corporates are making around those tensions with relation to where they buy from, where they sell to, the direction of, of perhaps the investment in their supply chain. Those are big decisions that people make with you know, a 10 year, 20 year time horizon. And I don't think anything has changed that's really going to suddenly cause a shift in those kind of decisions. But I guess what, what hasn't changed or what's remained consistent is the uncertainty and the volatility that, that we've seen probably over the last 24 months or so, particularly, as you said, with regards to the US-China trade war, etc. How does, how does a lot of that uncertainty affect corporate buying decisions, treasury functions, and also their, decision with, their decisions with respect to access to trade and receivables finance as a whole? You know, I don't mean to be repetitive, but again, I think the answer is not nearly as much as I expected. Um, I think, you know, when, when lockdown really kicked in in sort of March, everybody was struggling with getting from the office to working from home. You know, JP Morgan moved basically the whole population home over a weekend. Um, many of our corporate clients were doing the same. You would frankly have expected a lot of those conversations to just come to a screeching halt. Um, people didn't have time or energy to, to deal with big projects. But although there was a temporary slowdown, it picked back up really quickly. And actually, you know, the circumstances that we find ourselves now only drive, I guess, the corporate need for working capital, for liquidity, for making sure their counterparties and their supply chain are okay. They only drive that more. So actually, I think it's a real compliment in many ways to the, the, the corporate world, how effectively people manage to switch to, to working from home, because those conversations picked up very quickly and we've actually seen loads of projects moving forward effectively, some of them being accelerated because they're needed more than ever now. We've seen you know, new RFPs being launched, big new projects being, being picked up. So I, I've really been amazed that, that if anything, demand's gone up. No, very, very interesting. And, and I guess let's go into a little bit more detail about some of those those rapid changes that have perhaps been been forced onto onto the bank and, and also some of the, some of the corporates, particularly with respect to the the physical restriction of the, of, of the movement of people. Um, I, you know, it, we're certain to say that trade digitalization has has been on on track and on a course for quite some time now, and and I guess we really have seen a bit of a rapid acceleration uh, since the start of the COVID nineteen pandemic. What are, the, what are the wider opportunities around digitalization here? What does that mean for JP Morgan? And what actually needs to be done, in your opinion, to, to start thinking about some of those big questions around how do we fully digitalize trade finance? Yeah, so, so I'm a little wary of kind of overselling the, you know, the pandemic drove everybody digital kind of pitch because I think when we again when we look back on this in a year or two it may not have been quite as dramatic as it appears now but for sure everybody who had been resisting for whatever reason having a digital channel set up with their trade bank or indeed i guess with their their freight forwarder their shipping agent anybody else they had to figure out an alternative very quickly and under not very ideal circumstances um, we rolled out as an emergency our electronic presentation solution for lc documents to more countries than it was previously available in um, we had some um, advancements rolling out for our online banking system anyway, but one of the ones that was really well timed was Trade Express Inquiry, which is a, a tracking tool effectively for, for trade transactions, which is accessible to any party in the transaction. Um, so 
we certainly had to respond and indeed that response is ongoing and nowadays if we're setting up a new trade relationship with a client we do politely put them under a bit of pressure to sign up to a digital channel they don't have to use it if they want to send us paper day to day that's absolutely fine but as a continuity of business option we don't want to get caught out again you know some markets had extremely strict lockdowns as you know couriers couldn't move we want to, we never want to be in that position again where we might not be able to unstick a transaction that was stuck and certainly the response from clients has been pretty friendly to that as you can imagine it's in their interest as much as as ours um, i do think that where there are sort of the future looking trade solutions out there you know the blockchain consortia swift file act for example which is one that we've completed a, a pov for during the you know since the beginning of this year um, there has definitely been anecdotally an increase in take up of those solutions has it been enough to solve the fundamental problem which is the usual consensus problem which is until you have all the trade counterparties in any one single transaction from the buyer to the buyer's bank to the seller's bank to the seller the freight forwarder the shipper maybe the insurance agent as well until you have all those parties on the same digital platform for one single transaction you cannot digitize even one from end to end what i think is really hopeful um, is the move from those platforms taking a kind of one platform to rule them all approach that they want to be everything to all parties and i think the the increasing growth of some of those platforms that are niche they're targeted very nicely at specific types of client who of corporate who really need particular solutions and in future i think they will interoperate with each other and then you have something that is scalable very quickly and i'm very hopeful about that direction because i feel like then at last we might be able to really accelerate the, the digitization process yeah absolutely and 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 uh definitely something that we published in in our wca tfg blockchain for trade uh where do we stand research paper uh, ju just last week calling calling for i guess an acceleration in, in in interoperability and also standardization amongst the uh 50 plus platforms i think i think we mapped out there um um indicating you know there has been a lot of progress that has been made but it really is now on on actors to interoperate and, and work with each other whilst operating in, in these various silos right exactly so i guess to conclude this interview let, let's talk about an, an issue that that you know i i feel quite strongly about which is diversity in trade and trade finance and we found ourselves pretty much operating in a bit of a in a, in a totally new virtual environment uh, and i guess a bit of a personal question D natasha how has this affected some of the some of the key issues around diversity and inclusion that that still really exists as a big challenge in our industry so i guess the the effects of the pandemic in general have been not great, I think, for diversity and inclusion. I think that's been documented in the market. I, I, I think it's very important when you are sitting comfortably in your house, having a conversation with a gentleman from a magazine, that you should remember that, you know, there are many people who don't have the option of working from home. And in many ways, you know, we who do are the winners from the pandemic. We're relatively comfortable. We're able to get on with our jobs and pretty much keep the, the boat afloat without having to put ourselves at risk day to day. It's also the case, I think, that a lot of people who have been working from home don't have the world's greatest living conditions to do that. Um, you know, I've got a gentleman in my team who was stuck in the very strict lockdown in Madrid um, with his wife, who was also working, and two little girls who were climbing up the walls because they weren't allowed out. And frankly, the fact that he even turned up on the calls, I think, is nothing short of heroic. You know, anyone who gets their job done under those circumstances deserves a medal. Um, it has also been documented that in those circumstances, if somebody has to stop working to look after the children in circumstances where childcare isn't available, statistically, it's more likely to be the woman who does that. And that's obviously not, not great news for, for diversity in, in, in the broad, taking a broad look at it. Within our industry, I think a lot of the problem, however, has been less caused by the pandemic. The challenge we have in our industry, as I guess we all know, is that there is a, a, an, a much more diverse cohort coming up through the junior ranks right now, um, who are brilliant and inclusive and, and diverse and over time will become the leaders of our industry. And then we have a cohort who are probably within 10 to 15 years of retirement, 
who have incredible amounts of experience and knowledge, all of which is going to be lost when they retire and needs to be replaced by the sort of the, the fresh blood coming up behind them. So to me, in trade specifically to, to, to drive towards a solution of, to, to the diversity and inclusion problem, it's really all about bringing up young talent, making sure that people have opportunity outside their day job, people get to learn things they don't normally get to experience in one particular role, and really just making sure that you are creating paths for the leaders of the future to find their way to their first leadership role. And that's the duty of anyone in a management role anywhere in trade. Uh, and it's also entirely selfish and self-interested because if we don't do it, in another 10 years or so, we're going to find ourselves in a rather depleted industry, uh, which would be a shame when there's so much interesting new stuff going on. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think if you, if you take a look at uh, our industry, it really is supporting real economy growth in, right. in, in economies and markets all around the world. Um, um, and I think that's something that we should celebrate and, and also share best practices from from lots of different areas in, in, in the world. I mean, I was, I was on, a, on a session with EBRD yesterday discussing how can we accelerate the, the rate of development uh, through trade and access to trade finance in, in some of the emerging EU economies. And I think there are there are huge opportunities and, and we've really got to celebrate the diversity of, of, of the new the new management that will be in the future. I really think that's important and I, I think I see a lot more of that coming in terms of demand as well. I'm really excited about the structures of the future that are going to be designed. You know, I think when people talked about sustainable trade a year ago, they really were very focused on the E of ESG, right? It was all about environmental improvement and obviously that's still going to remain a rather critical target for an awful lot of people. But now there is also that focus on the S. How can we drive social inclusion through the use of our products how can we drive financial inclusion of people who might not otherwise have access to it how can we make sure that we're driving liquidity in an egalitarian way across for example a supplier population so that the smaller guys are not losing out because the bigger guys are easier to deal with that's really exciting and i think there is enormous progress happening on that almost you know every month there's going to be a really interesting future to see in, in that regard yeah, I can I can agree with you you more, and uh, I definitely think that's a that's a a, a podcast or a, a recording we should do in our in our next session because I'm sure we could speak about that for a, for a very long time. So Natasha, ending on a final question: what are your what are your big bold plans uh, for the core trade team at J.P. Morgan over let's say the next six months? Well, I, I I've I've had an amazing first six months, even though I've spent most of it in in, in my house. Um, I guess my, my plans are pretty straightforward. You know, we, JP Morgan's talked publicly about the fact that we want to transform our, our trade business, that we want to be in a different league. Um, we absolutely intend to compete on quality. That to me is the key part of the strategy. JP Morgan should be the bank that you turn to when you just want to make sure that it's gonna work. We're gonna be reliable, we will be fast, we will be smooth, we will be precise, we will get it done for you. And we're doing an enormous amount of work around that, as you can imagine. And I'm, I'm very fortunate in having a, a, an absolutely fantastic team who've got a lot more done just in the time since I, had, I was lucky enough to join than I could possibly have expected. So we're moving much faster towards some of our goals than, than we thought we were going to, frankly, at the beginning of this year. And we've hardly got started. Natasha, I think that really ties into the, the theme of the BAFT International Convention, which is financial intelligence, the balance between humans and technology. It's been great having you on Trade Finance Talks TV and really looking forward to your, your sessions at the, the BAFT International Convention. Thank you for joining. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.